Now, what is, what is the topic at hand? The topic at hand is, is the social environment in a retail context. Because let's be honest, um, one of the reasons that we still go shopping, right, and we don't do everything online, is because it's a social event. Often we go to the store because we want to go with our friends or we want to be seen in public because we're wearing something cool that we like or, or perhaps we just need to feel people around us. And I don't think that's frankly ever going to change, right? The notion of social in a retail context is very, very important. But when we've thought about social in a, in a, in a retail context, what's interesting to me, and this, and this goes to some of the, the previous talks that we saw today, right? A lot of what we know comes from people like Cialdini, right? That, that have shown us that there's some very strong, what I would call, main effects. And what I mean by main effects, right, is very simple A causes B. And, and one that I'll draw on a little later is the notion of similarity, which you heightened. It was really nice uh, that, that it was brought to the, the front. And we know that there's a strong main effect. You can run a two-cell design. And if someone's more similar than not similar, right, you're going to be persuaded. In a lot of these books, right, and, and I'm sure many of you have read Why We Buy by Paco Underhill. Have you read that one? So it's an older, it's like 1998. It's great to teach from, right? I did a teaching session yesterday, and I said there's lots of books you should read. These are some of the ones that I would read, right? Why? Because Paco Underhill, he's a researcher in New York, and the way he does research, much like my friends from <laughs> Italy, is he spends hours and hours and hours building data sets, right? And so he records up to 20 to 30,000 hours of video of people in stores. And so the book is about all the things you see in this social environment. That we know that people come into a store, they're more likely to go right than to go left, right? We know there's strong gender effects, that men are scared of stores and they'll only go about two thirds of the way into a store and then they run away. Whereas women will go all the way to the end, right? He talks about one of my favorite, the butt brush one. Do you know this one? That if we're shopping, we're kind of like cattle, like cows, right? And if something touches our bum, we just kind of move. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if it's another person or if it's a clothing rack. If something touches you, you just move, right? And we don't even know we do this. So what's cool about these books is they show a lot of main effects, right? And so often I think all the, the easy fruit, right, on the tree has been done when it comes to social influence in the social environment. So my challenge to you today, and I hope what you walk away from in this little talk, is thinking about the moderating influences of these main effects. And you saw some of that this morning, right? And what you'll see in these studies, what I'll try to bring to life, is I think there's a richness, this is my pitch, right? In this area of consumer behavior, to understand more. We were at lunch just now, and I was sitting around the table, and I was enjoying cheese, right? <laughs> and someone at my table, I won't put them on the spot, talked about some of the talks in the morning and said, you know, what's so interesting about the Cialdini work, you know, and how robust those effects are, depends on the context. In other words, the moderating forces that are there, right, in each specific situation, still have to be understood. Okay, so there's the, the academic pitch of where the frame on this is and where I think there's a real opportunity. When you, when you do this editor stuff, right, and you know, I talked about it on Monday, one thing that's interesting is they always invite you to the conferences and the consortium and they always want to know, where's the field going? And my answer is, I don't know, right? <laughs> but they really think you have an idea. It's quite funny, actually. The other thing I've learned is, as an editor, you only can publish what people send you. And since each project takes three years, it's not like anything I see, right, will actually be created by my speech today. Anything you start now will be the next editor. Or if you're really lucky like me, the editor after that editor. <laughs> I will really just publish what people have already done. But my talk today is to try to push a few of you to think about, you know, how fun this social context is. What I've decided to do is share four, four projects with you. And that sounds like a lot, but really it's not. Because I just took one or two studies from each of these projects. And, and share with you why I think it's kind of fun. I divided it in two. And by two, I mean the first is the social influence of other customers. And where that came about is, is, is with Jennifer Argo on her dissertation. And what's really sad, and I know there's a number 
of professors here that have had many students, but your first PhD student is the one that you tend to abuse the most, right? <laughs> and so as students, never pick an advisor if they've never had a student before. And if you ever talk to Jennifer Argo and ask her about her experiences, Darren, as she, he will, she will say, that guy's a jerk, right? Because <laughs> her PhD is like 600 pages, like this big, right? My students now, their PhD, they're like this big. And that's because, you know, the first one you want to try to make sure you get it right. She was awesome because she introduced this notion to me, and it doesn't come from a story from me, but she introduced the notion of this mere presence effect. And what I mean by that is whenever you're in an environment, other people around you that aren't your friends, that aren't a salesperson, that are just there, can actually influence you. And we ran some studies and published, published a dissertation, published a paper, and it kind of created a wave of people that started to do, you know, uh, things like this. And then, and then another wave on mimicry. So Tanya Chartrand and, and some of the stuff that Rob Tanner has done. And, and so you start to see a body of work talking about this mere presence. Well, this highlighted to me, right, a phenomenon that I was interested in, right? And this is a re <laughs> only in America, okay? <laughs> this is just offensive. It's so many levels to Europeans. But this is a restaurant in Arizona. It's a chain. Do you know this one? Exactly. The restaurant's name is the Heart Attack Grill. <laughs> and they literally have wheelchairs that they will wheel you out of the restaurant after you eat in. And, and the waitresses are dressed like nurses. And this is a regular burger there. This woman looks very shocked. Yeah, that is 9,000 calories. If you eat that burger, you don't have to eat for four days. <laughs> right? What is wrong with America? There's so many things wrong. But this is one of them. And so when I was traveling, and don't worry, I didn't eat here, but when I was traveling in the U.S., I come upon this place and I'm like, wow, this is crazy, right? What is it like to be in a restaurant like this and watch the other people eat? Because as you can imagine, they're pretty big people. And it got me thinking, you know, what are the mere presence effects of other people around you when you go to order food? And when you think about it, right, you're ordering food a lot in restaurants, at the movie theater, you know, maybe even in the drugstore, buying stuff. Do the people around you and the size of those people, does that influence what you, what you do? And this led to a project with, with Brent McFerrin, his eventual dissertation, that became known as the Fat Suit Project, right? And why we were excited about this project is we wanted to test in a new way, right, what is the mere presence effects of obesity in thin people? And where the... One of the contributions here was, is that we were able to tightly control, and I'm a big fan of a tight experimental control when it makes sense, but here we were able to tightly experimentally control the size of that individual by leveraging where we live. And you heard in the, the first talk today, right? I'm in Milan, I'm gonna leverage the fashion industry, right? Because there was, and I noted, no fashion in North America, no fashion in Asia. <laughs> South America's dead to me, right? <laughs> And you leverage where you are. Well, something you may not know about Vancouver is we're known as Hollywood North, and there's a lot of film production there. And so one of the studio houses had a, a production unit that did costumes. And, and last night we were in the bar, and we heard this song from Moulin Rouge, and as it turns out, you know, that was the production house that was actually there in Vancouver. They did the costumes, won the Academy Award for the Moulin Rouge. And since I knew they were in town, this is where they were located, I thought, Maybe I can go and have them build me a, what's called an obesity prosthesis. And so I had one RA, who is this woman here, right? And she agreed to do all of the, the, the studies for me. And we took her to the production house, and she had an obesity prosthesis fit to her exactly. So that she could go from 90 pounds to 190 pounds, and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And it was a cool experience to learn and see how, and this is the beauty of our job, right? To see how they do it in the movies how they had to form everything so that the rolls would fit nicely, how the breasts would fall the right way, right, and the thighs, and so that you couldn't tell if she was big or if she was small. We thought for fun we'd make Gavin Fitzsimmons dress up in the fat suit, but <laughs> he said he wouldn't do it. You have a tight experimental control, and away you go. What's funny about this is you can't really tell in that picture. She doesn't look really big, but actually she's quite big. But I remember showing this to, and I won't, 
name the community, but I was doing a presentation like this and I showed them the picture and one of the people put up their hand and they're like, but neither one of them is fat. I don't get it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, and then I looked around and I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's all the contrast effects. So that was one half of the manipulation, right? Is we wanted to look at this confederate body type and you can see very quickly, you know, it's a nice manipulation, very tight, very controlled. Previous work in eating had really had to vary the the person. So you'd get one of Darren and then you'd get one of Bob. And you don't have the same experimental control. So that's a, a fun little takeaway. The second part that we wanted to look at is what is the quantity taken? In other words, does it matter what the modeling behavior is of that person that you're standing in line behind? If they take a lot of food or if they take a little food, is that going to have an influence? And that became the interesting cross, right, beyond a simple main effect story. The cover story that we used, and so we did the first number of studies, and then we did do some field stuff that never made it in the paper, but we did a cover story where we had people just come into the lab and we said, look, we're showing video clips, one of these classic video clip studies, and you're going to do it in a separate room. We're bringing in, you know, a number of subjects to do it, right? And then what would happen is the confederate would come in either big or skinny. And we'd say, well, because we want this to be a realistic, what we're going to have you do is have some snacks. And so we had some fun food, right, right there that they could take. And the, the person that was the confederate, heavy or skinny, would take some snacks and then would go into the one room to watch the movie. The person behind them, who was the subject, right, would then take their snacks. Obviously, the manipulation is they would take a little bit, just two, or they'd take a lot, 30, right? Pieces of candy, M&Ms, this type of thing. And what we wanted to do then is to see what the person that had, you know, very simply come behind, what they would actually take and then what they would actually eat. And most of us would say this wouldn't have an impact at all. Because we live our daily lives and you say, look, I'm, I'm a free agent, nothing impacts me, right? But truthfully, we're impacted a lot, a lot more than we realize. And the results, when you look at well, what happened, right, is you see a, a really nice crossover interaction that pops out. And, and we get this repetitively, whether it's the candies taken, whether it's what you eat. It's a pretty robust effect, right? And, and to just kind of break it down for you, what happens and the way we interpret this is in a very, you can frame it with a number of theories, but the simplest is probably approach avoidance, right? Approach for that thin person. So whatever the thin person is doing, you want to try to model that just subconsciously because in our society, specifically in North America, the thin is idolized, right? And it becomes a licensing, almost a, well, you could argue somewhat of a licensing effect that that thin person is doing it, therefore I want to approach, I want to do that as well. Whereas you get an opposite effect with an obese person, right? Unfortunately, obesity is very much a stigmatized situation in, in, in North American society, and you push away from whatever the behaviors, right, that heavy person is doing. And so what that produces as an outcome is a very rich interaction where you see this approach avoidance based on the size of the individual and the behavior that they exactly exhibit. Okay? So we thought this was pretty cool, but the reviewers, right, because bless their hearts, reviewers, almost as bad as editors, right, they said, you know, this is interesting, but you use candy. Is it, is it just candy, right? And you know this week I've talked a lot about, well, how do you build a story, right? Because one of the big mistakes I often see with papers is people move too quickly as they build their experimental frame and story. And so the quick thing to do next, given that reviewer concern, is say, well, how robust is this effect? Is it just this candy notion? Or does it actually matter the type of food that is being used? Because it's an open question. Maybe this shows up just at the movie theater with the buttered popcorn. Does it happen with carrot sticks or something more healthy? And so we used a control of granola because even though in a caloric sense they're exactly the same, so you're controlled on calorie, in the consumer's mind, granola is way more healthy than M&Ms. And so you push the phenomena that you've observed in a very, very simple way. And the study build, which is what I've been pounding this week, becomes very straightforward, very add-on, very simple, right? And you use only half of the previous design so that you can show that the granola 
has the exact same effect as the M&Ms. So your second study out of your three, four, five study package continues to add to the body of knowledge that you see here. What does it add? Very simply, right? That it applies across all types of food. It isn't just a Coca-Cola slash popcorn slash M&M story. And so you walk away from this package, this paper, with a really nice takeaway, right? Very simply, that whether you use anchor and adjustment, which is the original theory we used here, Brian Wansink, uh, some of his stuff with Steve Hoke when, when he was just getting started, or you use approach avoidance, right? We're able to show that you're going to anchor, you're going to approach or avoid based on who that individual is and what they do. This creates licensing and avoidance and can dictate what you eat and what you consume as an individual. Practically, right, who's the most dangerous person to be around? Is it the big person? No. Wrong. She's like, no, no, no. It's the skinny people that eat a lot. Those are the people that you want to hurt, right? <laughs> no, they're just bad. Because you're going to approach and model whatever their specific behaviors are. There's a lot of research that actually supports that. And so we were able to find that as well. And it adds to that body of literature that becomes so interesting. So that's the first one I wanted to share with you. I picked a second one that was also consumer related. And I talked a bit about it earlier this week. And I thought, ah, I'll tell this story again because I know there's a lot of people that weren't here with me earlier this week. And this, this is, uh, you know, Janine grew up with me, so to speak, in Vancouver and, and, and uh, was in my lab 12, 15 years ago working for me, poor woman. And uh, <laughs> a lot of my crazy ideas come from things that I see. So I'm, I would, and I've said this earlier this week, a phenomenal based researcher. And one of the stories I shared was sitting at the bus stop on, if you know Vancouver, 41st in Granville, and in the mornings waiting for the bus, because I'd take one bus and then you take a second bus to get to the university. And I'd watch the people as they were getting on the bus and going about the day. And always by the bus stops in Canada, they have these newspaper receptacles. And I've, I told this story earlier, but what you observe is that people put the money in and they would pull out the paper. And what's interesting is they never take that top paper. They always take the second or third paper, and I can't figure out why. Like, they're just weird. Like, what the hell? There's nothing wrong with the first paper. And then when you go to a store, a bookstore, or you go to a, The Gap or H&M, one of these stores, people always take the second sweater, right? And they go try it on. And then you watch, and I think there's a gender effect on this. You watch, and they, they come back, and then they take the third sweater, and they buy the third sweater. See, you're laughing over there, Italy. <laughs> Because you do that. I know you do that. Right? And you're like, what's wrong with these people? Because there's nothing wrong with the top one or the second one. <laughs> but that's what they do. And so this, this led to a, what I thought was a really fun project where we tried to understand why this happens. Why, do, why are people scared of the top? And, and what we quickly discovered is it's really based in this law of contagion. And if, if you know Rosin's work, does anyone know Rosin's work in the 80s? <laughs> She's like, yeah, I know that work, yeah. right? You love that work? Yeah, because yeah, it's like cockroaches and exactly. Hitler's sweater. Do you love that one? Poison, yeah. yeah, it's like, would you wear Hitler's sweater? And everyone's like, no, right? <laughs> but we dry cleaned it. It doesn't matter, right? <laughs> it's pretty cool, these yeah. contagion effects. So we, we use that as an inspiration. And my co-author, Andrea Morales, said, well, how robust is this notion of contagion? in the retail context. And the setup here, you know, is, is, is one of the classic ones uh, that I learned as a PhD student from a guy named Peter Dark. Uh, and if you've met Peter, he's a really great guy. But what you do is you tell your subjects that you ran out of, so there's a fair amount of deception here, but steal this if it works for you, right? In your subject pool, you've ran out of studies because you have a very lazy faculty and there's not enough studies. So what you've decided to do is help the local businesses. And so what you're doing is you've asked the students to get their credit by helping the local businesses. Of course, that's all not true. But then they think they're not in a study, right? They think they're helping a local business. And so you say, don't meet us at the university. Meet us at this store. And so what happens is the students come to the store and you say, OK. What we're doing is a mystery shopper thing, right? Because mystery shopper market research is very helpful to the organization. And we want you to go into the store, and you have to have a purchase experience. And what we want you to do is one of 20 possible things. See how elaborate this cover story is, right? 
and we're going to make you choose from these 20 envelopes what your task is going to be. And it could be everything from trying on a shirt, right, to, to uh, looking at condoms maybe, right? And you give them 20 different things. Of course you don't. You have 20 envelopes and it all says go look at the shirt, right? But they don't know that. And so they select it and they're like, ah, oh, I get to go see a shirt. That's very exciting. And so we send them into the store, right? And they have to find the shirt. There's a picture of it. And find the, the confederate that this is the salesperson, right? And then come back out and report on their experience. Now, obviously, these types of studies, you know, it involves actually having a store that's willing to let you work in the store. And that's kind of cool. So you do that. And then you hire confederates, right? You hire one confederate to be that in the store person that works there and then you hire another confederate to be another shopper that social influence effect and you can see how in a one-way design that breaks across quite interestingly this the the product is either found right there on the sales rack so it's on the rack at H&M or we put it on the return rack and what I mean by the return rack is they have a change room often in North America and then you have a return portion right and then the third is it's actually in the dressing room and we have the confederate in each situation being close to it so that there's some control across conditions. You see the confederate coming out of the change room. You never saw them wearing it. You see the confederate walking by the sales rack or you see the confederate loitering around where that shirt is. Okay? So there's your setup. Pretty straightforward, pretty easy. What happens with respect to evaluation and purchase index is you get this huge main effect. So in terms of a study build, right, this is establishing the phenomenon. Often you see a nice one-way design that establishes the phenomenon very quickly. And you can see it's totally, totally linear with respect to far versus close, right? This is far from the contagion effect. What I mean by far is this is when it's on the rack, this is when it's on the return rack, and when it's a close contagion effect, you saw the person coming out of the change room and you know that they just had that on. And you hope the BO is going well that day, right? If you know what I'm saying. Now that's fine. That's a basic main effect. If I go back to my main push, what are the interesting moderators? And that's where the story gets, to me, honestly, more interesting. And we've run a number of studies that show moderators, right? One of my favorites that I wanted to share with you is a moderator of time. Because I don't understand this. It's, to me, it's not logical. But for people, the notion of contagion, right, having cooties or germs, is magical. That's why they call them, uh, and truthfully, it's called the laws of sympathetic magic. And for some reason, they magically disappear as time goes on. And so what we wanted to see, is that true in the retail context? It's kind of like, and this is a gross example, but it's true. Well, if you see someone's gone to the bathroom, like in the public washroom, often you just don't want to go to the bathroom. But if you wait 40 minutes, something magical happens and the bathroom is suddenly brilliant again, right? It's a weird phenomenon. The same thing happens when it comes to contagion. And so what we did is a very similar setup, but in this setup we indicated to the subject, oh, it was just tried on, or it was tried on a few days ago. We haven't been able to take it off the return rack and put it on the main rack. So you have the salesperson execute the manipulation of time by giving a very casual signal, right, as to how long that has been there. Does that make sense? And will that moderate the effect? Because then you have something I think that's truly interesting. And here's what you see, right? When the proximity of contacts far, when it's on the regular rack or a control where there's no person around, you get the same evaluation. In the medium context, right, when there's a long time elapsed, oh, it's been on the return rack for a couple days, no problem. But if it's been on the return rack for just a few minutes, oh my God, I don't want to touch it. <laughs> the moderator, within the specific context, makes the story much more interesting. Now, we took this piece and we sent it to the Journal of Marketing, and they, surprisingly at the time, were like, we love this, it's crazy, right? And so they published it relatively quickly. It was nice. So, yay, once in a while it works, right? But what they said was, this is really interesting, <laughs> this was actually kind of funny. They said, we would love to see a second paper. And I'm like, a second paper? <laughs> You're doing the happy dance, right? You're just like, <laughs> I can do a second paper, right? 
totally true. We were so happy. And they said, what could totally flip the effect? Because everyone always wants to flip effects, right? Let's, let's flip the effect. Let's make it go bang. So I thought, well, what's going to flip the effect for me, right? She's going to flip the effect for me. <laughs> and obviously, who's touching the product is a great context effect that you can play with. And so I had a blast. We did a modeling call, and we had 20 models come in, both men and women. And we're like, yeah, that one, that one, that one. <laughs> it's great being a professor, right? <laughs> And so we hired these people as confederates that would be in the store. This is actually the one of the ones that did it for us. She's really, she's really cool, very fun. And what you see here, right, is another moderation of the effect. There's a, obviously a cross-gender effect that's very, very powerful. Much more powerful for men, not surprisingly, than women. But it's the same direction, right? As a man, if you see a beautiful woman like that touch the product, you can't get it close. To, you're willing to pay big dough. That guy right there, he will pay double <laughs> if that girl has touched that product. Weird, eh? The same though cross-gender with women. If an attractive male touches it, away you go. Yeah. What's well, it? So obviously, I mean, that's it's some level intuitive, but it's kind of fun to do these types of studies. The sad part of this story was we wrote this paper up and we thought, yes, right? Two for one. We sent it to Journal of Marketing. Same freaking editor. He basically desk rejects it. <laughs> He's like, yeah, no, we've already published this paper. I'm like, dude, you told me we could publish a separate paper. So we ended up sending it to, to one of the other journals, and it was, it was published there. But very fun story for us, because it became a line of research that, that to this day we've had a lot of fun with. The notion of contagion, right? How other customers have a powerful social influence on you as the individual. Cool. I wanted to share with you the other side now, take it out of the consumer as influencer, and move it to the, to the salesperson, right? And, you know, uh, this was set up really nicely this morning. Uh, you know, there's a lot of books on selling. There's a lot of books by, from Cialdini on, on, on why this stuff is so important. Um, I wanted to dig in a little deeper because I've had a lot of experiences here that I don't quite understand. And so for me, this, this is, if people have asked me actually this week, what am I working on? This is kind of one of the areas that I'm still quite interested in is the notion of, of how do salespeople influence you and, and how can you be susceptible and, and buttress against it. The first one was set up really nicely, right? This notion of similarity and incidental similarity. And, and, and uh, referred to uh, the powerful effects of the birthday, right? And one of my favorite studies, does anyone know the studies uh, in the 80 about the mad monk Rasputin? Do you know this study? Uh, so you got to read old school psychology because it's just good stuff, right? So this study is my favorite. Do you know this one? No. You don't know so? So I think it's an 88 study, 86, 87, somewhere around there. And uh, they brought the students in and they said, they, found, they knew the students' birthdays before, right? And, and you'll see I use the same manipulation coming up here. So you know the students' birthdays before. They come into the lab or into the classroom and you say, oh, today we're going to talk a little bit about Rasputin, this individual from Russia, right? And they tell you a little history about him, right? He's kind of a bad guy. He killed some people, sort of, right? Did some bad stuff and this is his birthday. Right? And so one condition is it's you have the same birthday as Rasputin, right? And then in the other condition, you don't, right? And so then they ask you after the session, you know, so what do you think about Rasputin? Can you tell us, like, his moral fiber? Was he a good guy or a bad guy, right? And what they find is if you shared the birthday with Rasputin, he was misunderstood. <laughs> he was actually quite a good man. He had some redeeming qualities. A lot of national pride, right? Whereas, obviously, if you don't show the birthday, <laughs> bad, very bad, not who you want to meet in a bar. And so, you know, that's one of the first studies on this notion of little things like birthdays. These incidental similarities can really push it. And, 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 and kudos to, to my partner over here who, who brought this to life. Now, this type of effect has been shown for all kinds of incidental similarities, right? The, the, name, the name letter effect is a good example. Uh, another great example is, you know, where did you go to school, the university you went to, your hometown, what's your major? All of these types of things show up as very incidental similarities. Where I became interested in this is actually, of course, skiing. And up at Whistler, those of you who've been to, I don't think anyone 
Maybe here's been to Whistler. But what's interesting is I got these beautiful hotels. And, and one of the hotels I quite like is the Westin, because it has the heavenly bed, right? The big white pillows and white stuff. And you jump in, and you're in the cloud, and it's really great, right? But the other thing I love about the Westin is the salespeople at the front that wear these little name tags. And what's interesting and that I couldn't figure out is on the name tags, it says, hi, I'm Sally, right? And I really love dogs. Right? And I'm like, I don't care that you love dogs, Sally. <laughs> right? And then you see the next person, it's like, hi, my name's Bob, and I love magic. And I'm like, what the hell is going on at this hotel? And every single employee is wearing these little tags, right, with something that they do. And then I look at, at Whistler at the ski resort, and it has tags for people, and again, the names, and this time where they're from. And what's interesting to me is what's happening, right, is this incidental similarity phenomenon. Trying to create very quick connections, right? And this is one of the questions I was going to ask you, actually, is, is as you push deeper on similarity, you, you get this notion of connection and that we all have a fundamental drive to feel connected, right? It's just, it's, it's very base for us in, in, in a Maslow-type way. And so how can you push this around, right? And so the first study is, again, Another example of study build, we wanted to show that this basic main effect of similarity, which you saw previously in a kind of a different frame, is, is very robust. And how we did this, and the reason I'll tell you is it sets up the second study, which I think is far more interesting, because it adds the context, those moderators, and that's what makes the theoretical contribution work, why it got published. For us, again, it's one of these little fun uh, Stories where, you know what, we ran out of studies again. The UBC professors, Kate White and Joey, they're all very lazy. Um, so we need to help out the local fitness gym. And what we've told them we'd do is we'd let their trainers come in and pitch their uh, personal fitness program. And so what we'd like you to do as a subject is come in and they're going to pitch their personal training. And then you can evaluate whether they did a good job and, you know, whether you would, if you were looking for a personal trainer, would you hire Gunther or Sally, or whoever the, the, the confederate was, okay? Now, we gave them a, a basic information of the program, a little mini biography of the personal trainer, and then they got to meet the personal trainer for the intro session. So the session was, you know, I don't know if you have a personal trainer, but they, they do a, a thing with you about what are your personal goals, right? What, and someone's like, yeah, totally, I've got five trainers, I'm very good at it, right? <laughs> it's what I do, okay, fair. So same thing, right? Very specific. The manipulation, which is so fun and so precise, right, is, is we did birthday. And, and in this paper, if, if you've seen this paper, we have, I don't know, five or six studies. And we do it a bunch of different ways. It's great when you're doing a phenomenon like this to, to spread out the love, show that it's not just birthday, show that it's hometown, where you did your degree, these types of things. What we do, which is really great, another tip is, we do a pre-survey with our subject pool. So everybody that sits in our subject pool, we, we survey them as soon as they come to class, and then that data sits. And then you can match that data, obviously, with, with uh, student number, right? You take the first seven out of eight digits, and then that preserves anonymity. That's the way that you do it ethically. And then that enables you to match whatever individual difference variable, and we had some questions about that early in the morning, to that individual, but you've created a long separation in terms of measurement. So you don't have some of those measurement concomitant variation type of situations, if that's what you're interested in avoiding. And they don't know, you know, why you measured self-esteem here, but it's okay, because it's showing up over here. It's, it's, a, it's a trait instead of a state situation. So I recommend that, if you have that as an ability in your subject pool programs, because you can just get tighter manipulations. So we recorded their birthdays, and then three months later, we run them through the lab, right? And this is the manipulation. It's a beautiful, controlled manipulation. The only thing that changes across condition is whether July 7th, 1983, and it's not highlighted when they get it, right, matches your birthday. We know what your birthday is. My research assistant is typing out the form as they're coming into the lab, and they can, boom, hit every person in that condition with the match. Really nice, really tight. Well, what happens as a result is you see this strong main effect, which is, shouldn't be a surprise to anybody because we learned about it this morning. When you match the, the birthday, oh my God, that's the best trainer ever. I would totally buy from that trainer. Now, when you do a spiral debrief afterwards, they say, well, they have the same birthday as me? Really? A lot of them can't identify. 
And they would all say, no, that doesn't influence me. That's stupid. That's an incidental similarity. Well, they don't say those words, but why should that impact? It has a direct impact, right? And we saw that this morning. What I'll add to what we learned this morning is how can you moderate? And so this is what we thought would be interesting, right? The second study I'll share with you is you take that notion of incidental similarity, right? And then you add a couple moderating, and I picked the, the most messy, complicated one because it's kind of cool, and you say, okay, you're the same as them, but what happens if the relationship is short versus long term? And what I mean by that is you're only going to meet them in this session, and you're just helping them versus you're meeting this in this session, and guess what? You know, this is going to be your trainer if you decide to do it. So the potential for shorter long-term relationship does that moderate that incidental similarity effect. Coupled to that, the valence of the experience, right? So you have them doing the sales pitch. Are they really lovely and nice or are they a complete asshole when they do the sales pitch? And so you play with the experience, right? Building on that basic main effect to see what happens when you push it around. Now you can do this in different ways, and we've did it both in terms of having a live experience, and in the example I'm showing you here, we did a video clip of the trainer. Hit me. Yeah. 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 They don't even know it, but they're being biased, so why would it matter? And, th and that's what's really interesting. So intuition is great. And on the positive side, what you'll see, I'll give you the punchline right now, is it's a main effect. It's exactly what you predict. Okay. okay? But on the negative aversive side, that's where you get the interaction between the moderators. Okay. And the relationship does matter. And, you, and you'll see in the play out of the data, if I recall it correctly as I move to the next slide, that that's where it actually shows up, partly because of what you're saying. Look, this person, yeah, I have an incidental similarity with them, right? But because I know I'm going to have to be with them for a long time, and they're an asshole, it, it mitigates the effect. And so what you see in the moderation is you actually see these two working together to get punchy. It doesn't show up on the positive side exactly why you're saying. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Which is cool, I think. Sure. Yeah. Would that be then two additive effects? So you're basically canceling out the other effect by having an additive? That's, that's in essence, that's one way you could frame it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll show you a little, uh, another interesting thing on in the data that's all speculation that, that kicks up on, on the notion of the asshole effect that you'll see in a second, but I thought it was kind of interesting. We used a video, and so one thing that I, I have been known for over the years is doing these, they're not like real shopping experiences, but you know, these fake cover story like I've shown you. But I've also seen video clips can also do this fairly closely. They're better than like a written scenario. Uh, and, and people can immerse themselves into that video clip. And so we use that type of t technique on this specific study where we showed, you know, the video trainer and they were pitching to the subject, right? So it was a, a, a trainer pitching their product to the subject. They talk about themselves at the beginning. That's where the execution on the incidental similarity was. And then they talk about, you know, the program. And the valence, right, was well, the cover story was that this video was a raw video. We hadn't edited it yet. And so, you know, we still had to edit it up, but there was some trailer material at the end. And so in the good condition, right, something goes wrong with the video at the end. And in the good condition, the positive valence, the trainer's like, hey, oh, no, no problem to the guy filming, right? My friend filming, right? It's like, oh, great job. I love the microphone. It's great. Right? I can't wait to put it under my shirt. Yeah, you know, being very positive, right? But then on the negative one, the trainer gets done the pitch, so we kept that tightly controlled, but instead of being nice to the video person, they're like, what the, f come on, man. Like, what are you doing? You're better than that, right? And just giving some real, right? And so the subject's watching this, and obviously the manipulation is very strong. It's a big hammer, and away you go. Well, what does it show as a pattern of effects, right? And here's your strong, this is what you were waiting for, right? You see the main effect on the left side, not really interesting. It's pure replication of a basic fundamental main effect. What becomes cool and where you see the reversal, right, is over here. 
instead of having that same mean effect, what happens is when it's an enduring relationship, I gotta be with that guy that just yelled at the video guy? No way, I don't wanna purchase, right? What I find fascinating, right, is the enduring relationship when it's not an incidental solumentary, this actually pops up. It's like, I like that asshole. <laughs> I want him as my personal trainer. That's gonna be awesome, because he's gonna make me work. That's the way we interpret it. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> But what became important for the paper, right, is this really cool reversal. Again, the takeaway on this study, right, very simply is that we do have this base need for connectedness. Uh, we talked about this a bit this morning. And the nature of what the outcome is can actually moderate and, and in some ways mitigate what, what you show when you get this, this similarity effect. Where's the takeaway for managers? And this, you know, I would say, well, beyond theoretical, it's a really nice practical example that you have to be careful with your sales force management. Right? And what I mean by that is if the incidental similarities, so if your salespeople are chatting up the customers and they establish this connection and rapport, but then they give really poor service, it actually can hurt you far more than that potential incidental similarity could have, could have helped you. And that's where this paper you know, had something interesting to say. Now, I've presented this fairly quickly. It's, it's fairly, fairly simple. Um, I love this study because some of what we found butts up against that first example. If, you, if you're doing the mental gymnastics, right, the Rasputin thing also is a negative, aversive, and yet you saw the similarity effects. So obviously there's even more going on there, right? And that's proof, or at least my belief, why these types of research questions are really fun to work on. All right, last one. I'm doing okay. I've got 15 on the floor. Um, yeah, so this is a personal story, and, and some of you know this one. I think I shared it with a couple of you. Um, yeah, this is recent. This is my most recent paper that was published. Why, why did this paper happen? Um, truthfully, it happened in, in uh, Vancouver. And I was trying to get a new cologne, right? Because I'm one of these guys that I like to wear the cologne. It makes me feel like all sexy and stuff. So I had found this new cologne by Hermes. And uh, one of my, again, <laughs> friends over here, Italy, fashion. But it's a French brand, so there. Um, and it was a grapefruit cologne, and I, w I thought it was awesome. Like, let me tell you, those of any of the men in the room looking for a new cologne, this is like citrusy. It's wonderful. Women love it, right? <coughs> and so I'm like, I got to buy some of this. So... They have a nice Hermes shop in Vancouver, in downtown Vancouver, catering to the tourists. <coughs> and so after work one day, and we at UBC, we're at the school I have, we have a downtown campus, and I had finished teaching. Um, actually, I wasn't teaching. I had a meeting for exec ed. And I had thought I'd go over to the store, right, and go pick up a bottle, because why not? That would be really great. And, and then I would smell good. And so I walked over to the store, and those of you that know me know that this right here, even though... Some people have told me this is not dressed up, right? This is really dressed up for me. And so <laughs> most of the time I'm wearing a t-shirt and there's probably some holes and socks 50-50, right? So I'm not always looking as good as one might think or hope. And there's reasons for that that we can get into. It's a lot of deep childhood things perhaps. But anyway, right, I'm walking in. I go into the store and it's true. I did look like I had been sleeping in my car or something like that. <laughs> And I walked into the store, and the saleswoman was at the counter, and she was working on her books or something, like doing the accounts maybe. I don't know what she's doing. And she looked up, and she looks at me, and she just goes, <sighs> and then goes back to her. And I'm like, oh, you bitch, right? I'm like, oh, so rude. And so instead of like leaving the store, I'm like, well, game on, right? Like, you want to go? I'll meet you at the bike racks. Let's go. So I walked into the store and I pretended that I'm shopping, like looking at the scarves and <laughs> looking at the perfume. And then I found the cologne that I was wanted to buy. And so I grabbed two bottles, right? And I go to the counter. And I'm like, bam. And I'm like, I'm going to get these two. And she's like, OK. And she rings them up and I leave the store. And as I'm leaving, it kind of hits me like, what the hell just happened, right? That woman gave me terrible service. She was a total bitch. And I bought double <laughs> what I went in there to buy. What's wrong with me, right? I'm like this consumer behavior professor and <laughs> I sleep in my car and I'm not smart, right? It's really bad. 
And obviously this is like the pretty woman effect. And many of you have seen this, this movie and you know that she goes into the store and they treat her poorly and she leaves and she comes back, big mistake, right? That's kind of the fun punchline. And so this led to a big project that, that we, we finished up. Obviously Oprah was also, I'm trying to make myself feel good. I'm very similar to Oprah. We were both snubbed by Hermes. It's a true story? Which story? Uh, yeah, yeah, you don't know this one? No, no. Oh yeah, North, this happened in Italy. It's those guys. <laughs> It was, wor well, in North America, it was worldwide. She went into to Hermes in Italy. She was shot, was it in Milan? No, I think it was in Paris. <laughs> you think it was in Paris? Ha! <laughs> it was in Italy. <laughs> Something in between. Something in between. <laughs> no, it was in Switzerland. It was in Switzerland? <laughs> Look at, she's helping you on YouTube. <laughs> it's totally the Swiss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good compromise. Blame the Swiss. Yeah, okay. So what ha happened is she went into the store and she asked if she could if she could see the handbag. She wanted to buy one of the high high end Hermes handbags, and the sales clerk's like, "No, I won't show it to you." And she's like, "Well, why?" And she's like, "You can't afford it." <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. And you had and you you have to leave the store type of thing. And so she left. And this was a big in, in North America. This was a big international incident because obviously we're very in the U.S. very race sensitive right now. And so, you know, stereotype of, which you would think, Oprah Winfrey, the stereotype is billion dollars. <laughs> and so, of course, the company apologized and, and offered her free handbags, probably. I don't, I don't remember exactly what happened, but. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, as you would expect, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you're like, mm-hmm. So that's why I put the slide up, because I feel an affinity, uh, even though she doesn't look like she sleeps in her car. Both of us had bad, bad sales experience. So what we wanted to do in this study, and, and why uh, I think this study is kind of fun, is we wanted to see if this effect that I experienced, is it just because I'm a really weird person? Or can you get this effect to exist beyond the sample size of one? And I talked yesterday about the problem of the sample size of one. And so often a lot of my projects are based on, and for those that weren't there yesterday, sample size of one is a problem you have where you think the world, we all have this problem, the world revolves around you, and the way you see the world is the way everybody sees the world, right? And so I wanted to see, and this drives a lot of my research, is the way I, I react is that, is there another <laughs> person, another segment out there that fits the same? And so we did this in a very simplistic way. And we used scenario. And, and I'll show you, I think I have three studies here to finish with. But in this first study, you can kind of see what we try to do. Right? What we try to do is we just give people a scenario. And this is like a classic MTurk. I do use MTurk, right? It's OK. <laughs> Once I said don't use MTurk, and as an editor, you can't say things because then people like believe you. <laughs> but you can definitely use MTurk. Uh, we, had, we thought this was really appropriate for an MTurk play. And what we did was we give a very tight Scenario where we used replicates, I'm a big fan of replicates, right? Because it removes the problem of over manipulations, et cetera, et cetera. And we, we did two types of RAND replicates. We had your high end, your Gucci, your Louis Vuitton versus, and Burberry as well. And then American Eagle, Gap, H&M on the other side, right? And so that's your brand replicates. You're looking at six of those. And then the only thing that changes with respect to the way the salesperson behaved is the word condescending. So it's a very tightly controlled manipulation. Either it says condescending or it doesn't. And that's not a weakness of the study, right? But that's, that's something very specific to this study. We chose the word condescending because it's the most powerful word we could find when it came to salesperson behavior. But certainly you could push me if you wanted to on is that a complete accurate representation of bad salesperson behavior? No. But we thought that it, would, it was something that could really move the dial in terms of a hammer. And this is what we found, right? That sales person behavior in the luxury brand context, when you put the word condescending, you can flip the reaction. Exactly what happened to me on an MTurk example replicates quite nicely. Now, obviously, in a mass brand sample, you get the stereotype. Good service equals people that want to buy them. So then why does this happen? Well, most of you can intuitively figure out, well, you know, this is like being in high school, right? Nicole Mead, who I'm sure many of you know, she's at Erasmus. She has a really nice paper, right, 
on ingratiation when you want to join a social group. And she, she does studies with cocaine and chicken's feet. If any of you read that paper, it's a great paper, right? And this is the same type of effect. The contribution of this paper over Nikki's paper is that we show this cool moderator in this luxury context, right? We try to show that the store matters and the type of person matters. We moderate the effects. Back to my original point, right? What is that moderation of the individual, the high school thing that I'm talking about, right? It's the notion of do you aspire versus do you identify with the brand, right? Because these effects only show up if you want to be part of the cool kids in high school. If you're already a cool kid, it doesn't happen. If you don't care, it doesn't happen. But for the susceptible consumer who wants to be cool, like me, get the cologne, right? You can push my button in the sales context and motivate me. And that's what we're capturing in this experimental study, right? Study two, we do the exact same thing and instead we measure using one of these classic different score measures, how much do you aspire versus identify with the brand. And if you're already decked out, right, in Gucci, you don't get the effect. And that's a separate phenomenon that I do want to study is what's wrong with the people that have like Gucci shoes, Gucci pants, Gucci this, Gucci this, <laughs> like they're all Gucci. Like there, there's, some, there's something wrong there. We should study this, right? But if that happens, it really upsets you when you receive condescending behavior. What I find fascinating, right, is that you get that flip when you aspire. So hopefully everybody sees that. That's the basic psychological me mechanism that's driving this. And it only shows up for brands that you aspire to. Now obviously the reviewers pushed us and they said, Darren, we love, we love this stuff. It's kind of fun. You know, maybe the news will like it. Um, but is it just luxury brands? Could it be any product that people aspire to? And so we had to run the last study, right, to see if, if it was actually generalizable across domains. And so we changed the context from luxury to eco-friendly because in North America there's a segment of people that aspire to be eco-friendly. And so what you see here, right, is a rejection versus neutral, self-concept measure, ideal versus actual, and then another moderator, does the salesperson fit the brand? And, and when I've presented this before, uh, uh, many of you know, I'm sure many of you know Kevin Keller, big brand guy, right? He actually thought of all the studies like, yeah, that's great, that's great, that's great. But when I got to this one, right, he's like, okay, now that's interesting, right? Because there isn't a lot of research in terms of salesperson and how they mirror a brand and what, what the power of that marker is in that specific sales context with a brand lens. And, and I, I agree with him. I think that's kind of interesting. And that's where an opportunity to, to do more probably sits. We did this, the last two studies in this paper we did in real life. So we hired actors, models again, and we had them come in and they did a sales pitch. The, the study previous I didn't show you. We had them come in and they had a lookbook, right? And they showed what the next uh, season would have for handbags. And then they were either rude or they were nice and you get the same effects. In this one, we had a salesperson that was selling the cars and they were doing the pitch. We, again, were helping out a local car dealership and the person was practicing the pitch. In one of the conditions, he looked like to this population, an eco-friendly car salesman, which apparently does look a very specific way, versus a non-eco-friendly car salesman. Okay? The other thing that we did here that was interesting is we measured it in the moment, and then two weeks later, we brought our subjects back and we said, it's cool that you can press people's buttons. Well, maybe it's not cool, maybe it's bad. You can press people's buttons in the sales experience in the moment, but what happens when you go talk to them two weeks later? Do they still have this, I want to do it, I'll pay more? Or is it some type of boomerang effect? And we didn't know, right? What you get when you look at the data is you replicate when you get the fit. So if the brand does match the salesperson, in other words, that salesperson is a pure representation of the cool kid high school group that you want to belong to, then the effect rings true. If it's a misfit on the right side, right, you see basically a flat line, which is interesting. What I thought perhaps was the most interesting <coughs> is that over time, the effect reverses. And so while in that moment you're like, yeah, I want to buy this and I like it and I'm going to show you Hermes saleswoman, 
right? Two weeks later, you have a less positive impression of the brand and of that specific experience. And, and what was interesting is I was talking with a news, a news reporter from The Atlantic, uh, a magazine in America, and they asked me, did you go back to that Hermes store? And I haven't gone back for five years, actually. I just went back this Christmas to buy something for my wife for Christmas. But, you know, I, and I don't know if it's because of that specific experience, but I'm like, yeah, I guess I am these specific results. For me, and then we'll, t we'll take questions, for me this is kind of fun and interesting stuff because obviously it's built out of a phenomena, but to me it's much richer because it shows the complexities, again back to my original story, of why these interesting main effects on social influence can be more colorful and exciting when you start to drill down on the specific context. One of my favorite quotes is from Groucho Marx, I never wanted to join any club that would have me for a member because that's the way we are as individuals. My big picture takeaway, today I was shopping in an upscale store and as I was changing I heard one of the snobby salesmen say to mine, you shouldn't bother, she isn't going to buy anything. Determined to show her I proceeded to purchase everything I'd tried on. It came to around $500, my credit card was declined. <laughs> I pulled that off a blog. Um, Social environment is dynamic and influential. I think it's a great place to do research. One of the big problems is obviously these types of studies, a lot of what I've shown you today, take a bit more resources, a bit more <coughs> time. But I think you can have a lot of fun with it. You know, other customers, salespeople, lots of interesting things pop out here. And, and I hope you've had some fun as I've walked through four of these different papers that I've worked on. Um, I've had a blast even just sharing them with you. And so I'll close it here with my little picture of Vancouver. And thank you for paying attention and having fun with me. Thanks, guys.